Welcome back to Barton EMS Education, and right now we're going to go through the respiration uh, section, understanding more components about respiration inside the body. And this is part of the airway management, respiration, artificial ventilation sections. Respiration uh, is, is a very interesting topic when we look inside the body on how it works. And we need to understand the relationship between the heart and the lungs uh, in regards to respiration. Now in regards to respiration, uh, we've got several different functions that are going to happen. And we have things that we have the anatomy that is going to help us with our respiration. We've got the vascular system which is connected with the heart that is going to help us with our respiration. And as well as the components inside the lungs. Now, the right side of the heart, as we understood way back in, in anatomy and physiology, is the right side of the heart is going to receive the systemic circulation that is being sent throughout the body, and it's going to drive the pulmonary circulation by pushing it out towards uh, the lungs. And the left heart is going to receive the pulmonary circulation, the left side of the heart, and it's going to drive the systemic circulation by pushing, pushing it out to the rest of the body. Now there is a automaticity factor that's going on here because we don't have to worry about what's going on inside the body. The body just does it naturally. And then we have all the different parts of the capillary beds, the art arteries, the arterioles, the venules, and the veins, and the, the tissues, and the cellular beds. All of those are, are working together to get the oxygen and CO2 to exchange. And now the cells, the cells themselves are going to perform a specific function, and this requires chemicals in order to function. And those chemicals are oxygen, glucose, and electrolytes. Cells have to excrete waste products, including carbon dioxide and water, and they have to do that in a manner that allows the body to still get energy, but also get rid of the waste products. And so we do this through aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. And we also do this through aerobic and anaerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration is where we use oxygen uh, involved in this um, issue. This issue of aerobic respiration versus anaerobic respiration and how they get energy into the cell. Aerobic respiration is going to use oxygen where anaerobic respiration is going to be in the absence of oxygen and it's still going to provide energy to the cell. So the differences between our external respiration and our internal respiration is the fact that external respiration is the exchange of respiratory gases between the alveoli and the pulmonary capillary beds. However, internal respiration is the exchange of those gases between the systemic capillaries, the body's system, and the surrounding tissue beds. Now, these all culminate to create products in cellular respiration and metabolism. Cellular respiration and metabolism is the use of oxygen and carbohydrates. Remember, carbohydrates, sugars, mmm, yummy. Uh, we use those to produce energy, and energy and create carbon dioxide and water as byproducts of this metabolism. So ventilation, ventilation is the movement of air in and out of the lungs, where respiration is the movement of the gases. So we have respiration, that is the movement of gases where we talked about in the internal and external respiration the movement of gases but ventilation is the movement of air in and out of the lungs so one is movement of gases and one is the movement of air in and out of the lungs so ventilation is the movement of air in and out of the lungs respiration is the movement of gases between certain things like alveoli and the capillaries or the systemic capillaries and the tissues now let's move on and talk about what is the difference between inhalation and exhalation. Well, inhalation, inhalation is the ability for us to 
take in air. Exhalation is when we exhale or get rid of that air. And when we talk about these two processes, it's important to understand that we have to have inhalation to function our lungs, and we also have to have exhalation to function. If those two have a alteration, it's not going to work. If we can't get rid of the gases that we have inside our body, then we're not going to be able to function. If we can't inhale the gases, we're not going to be able to function. So we have to have those two. So inhalation is bringing the gases inside the lungs through ventilation, and exhalation is getting rid of the gases. Now what gases are we bringing in depends on the environment we're in. Now let's discuss tidal. Tidal volume is the volume that we use to represent the amount of volume of air during inhalation and exhalation. And we go through a whole lot of mathematical principles, but the one thing I want you to take away from tidal volume is the approximate tidal volume that we give an adult person is about 500 milliliters per inspiration. Or the formula you could also use is 7 milliliters per kilogram of their body mass. So if you can figure out how much they weigh, divide that by 2.2, uh, their pounds to get them to kilograms, and then take that uh, 7 milliliters per kilogram. So per kilogram, uh, if they're 100 kilograms, they're going to have 700 mLs of tidal volume. Now dead space, dead space is where we start talking about the gases that are not getting exchanged inside the body. Uh, those gases are carbon dioxide and oxygen that are not exchanged across the alveolar membrane in the respiratory tract, and that is dead space. Respiratory rate, anytime you see the word rate in EMS, rate means things that we have to take in time. So what is your pulse rate? What is your respiration or respiratory rate that is in time? So we're going to count this in the number of minutes. So in one minute, how many respirations are you going to breathe? So if you're breathing, and you breathe six times in approximately six seconds, take that times 10, you're breathing 60 breaths in one minute. Now, you could do it for 30 seconds and on all the mathematical formulas, but it's the amount of breaths you're going to take in one minute. Now, minute volume, minute volume can also be called the minute ventilation or the respiratory minute volume, and it's the volume of gas inhaled or exhaled from a person's lung per minute. So we have tidal volume, the amount of volume that we can take in in one breath, 700 mLs, 500 mLs, depending on how big the person is. And then minute volume is how much volume they're going to get in one minute. One minute. And then what is oxygenation? Oxygenation, oxygenation is the process of loading oxygen molecules onto hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is that protein on red blood cells that allows for oxygen to be carried on it. However, it has a higher affinity to carbon monoxide, uh, much higher affinity, and that's why we'll still see an SpO2 set that says 98% for carbon monoxide, uh, but they, they don't have enough oxygen inside their system. And so we'll have to offload that with high concentrations of oxygen. So oxygen is the, uh, the amount of oxygen molecules, oxygenation is the amount of oxygen molecules on the hemoglobin molecules uh, in the bloodstream. So what is perfusion? Perfusion is the passage of blood to a capillary bed in tissue. Now, we understand that it's far greater than this. It's not just blood. It's blood with nutrients. It's blood with oxygen. And to be someone who's adequately perfused, we want to make sure that the, it's oxygenated blood going to the tissue. And that's what perfusion is. Now, let's discuss this last one on this page. Describe three things that interrupt pulmonary ventilation from the nervous system. Three things, three things that are going to interrupt uh, pulmonary ventilation from the nervous system are things like drugs. Uh, if someone takes drugs that are going to inhibit their uh, pulmonary ventilation, their ventilations, uh, it could be some type of drug. 
Uh, it could be traumatic injuries to the, the head, as well as muscular dystrophy when we start taking muscles out uh, and how they communicate through the nerve endings, uh, we can start having issues and interruptions in the control of the nervous system. Uh, let's keep on keeping on. So uh, then you have to describe those uh, three things like drugs, trauma, um, and uh, muscular dystrophy. What is bronchoconstriction? Bronchoconstriction is basically that boa constrictor wrapping around the bronchioles and it's constricting down. It's tightening down so that we can't get air passage, uh, movement of air through that air passage uh, through the bronchioles to have that exchange of gases down at the alveoli. And so how does a provider assess adequate ventilation? So to assess adequate ventilation, we have to look for signs and symptoms. And so what are the signs of adequate? ventilation and then what are the signs of inadequate ventilation so those are important things to go look at to figure out what are the signs of adequate ventilation what are the signs of inadequate ventilation so signs that you might have inadequate ventilation um, could be things like hypoxia um, things that are showing the ability that you can't have air movement like sounds like strider so what are signs of adequate ventilation? Signs of adequate ventilation is a normal respiratory rate. Breath sounds that are clear and equal on both sides of the chest. A normal tidal volume, a normal minute volume. Uh, but if they are showing nasal flaring, they're sweaty, they have abnormal breathing, they have abnormal breath sounds, um, their minute volume, which is your respiratory rate times your tidal volume, is decreased. Uh, we could have issues as well as impaired chest wall movement or irregular respiratory patterns. All of these things are inadequate ventilation signs. So when we look for signs, signs are things we see, symptoms are things people tell us. And then what is cyanosis? Cyanosis is the bluish coloring of the skin when we have inadequate uh, perfusion to the, the cellular level. Uh, and that is where we'll see that in the skin color. What is pallor? Pallor is an interesting uh, definition. It's a little different than um, cyanosis. Pallor sounds kind of like a, another word we might have heard about before. Maybe something like pale. Uh, now let's see. What is pallor? Pallor is that unhealthy pale like appearance and so we see individuals with this unhealthy pale like appearance that's that's an indication that we have inadequate tissue perfusion what is modeling modeling is where we have an individual that has that blotchy red purplish marbling of the skin it's not normally it's, it's kind of like a pale it's kind of like they're they're half perfused um, this is when um, we have something happening in the skin that comes before uh, someone dies, and it usually occurs during a final week of life, um, although in some cases and it, it can occur earlier. Um, and it occurs first in the feet and then starts traveling up the legs. So modeling is one of those things that you, you really don't want to see. So cyanosis is that bluish of the fingers or the lips. Pallor it sounds like pale. Uh, so it, it's a pale-like appearance, a white, uh, white appearance. And then modeling is that red purplish marbling of the skin and it's very blotchy. Now a pulse oximeter is the measurement tool we use to measure the amount of oxygen saturation that is on the blood. So a pulse oximetry it would be the how we go about it and pulse oximetry is when we we put it on their finger and we say this is the number that we have for how they're breathing. And then what number is our baseline for adequate oxygenation is 94%. The percentages of ambient air for oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide, oxygen is 21%, nitrogen is 78%, and carbon dioxide and other gases is 1%, all encompassing making up 100% of the air we breathe. The, what are the different sizes of oxygen cylinders that we use in EMS? The different size oxygen cylinders basically depends on the amount of volume that you're going to have of oxygen. 
Now your pressures are going to normally be about the same. You're going to have about 2200 PSI or about 2000 PSI in these oxygen cylinders. But the volume that is going to be held in those oxygen cylinders is going to be much more depending on their size or much less. So the different sizes, the most common one you're going to see in the back of an ambulance is going to be your D size cylinder. Uh, your D cylinders are what you're going to carry in your airway bag. It's what you're going to carry on your cot. Uh, your D cylinders are a very common size of oxygen cylinders. Uh, what a lot of trucks carry in their side compartment, usually behind the driver, uh, is a M iron tank. Um, and those are usually about 44 inches tall. They're heavy because of the iron, uh, and they hold a lot of oxygen. Those are your house O's as people call them. Uh, but you may also see an E cylinder, which is kind of in between your D and your M cylinder. Uh, your E cylinder is uh, what you're going to see sometimes under seats in some uh, transfer rigs. Um, they, they don't put as big of a cylinder in with the M cylinder, but they do put the E cylinder in um, just as kind of more of a, a short term, long term, kind of medium term. It's, it's, it's kind of in between. Uh, but most of the ones that I've seen have been D cylinders and M cylinders. I don't really see too many more. Uh, the other sizes of oxygen cylinders that are out there, uh, you'll see uh, because of people having home oxygen or how they use oxygen to transfer themselves from their concentrator in their home to getting in the car or when they're out and about because they're not using that much oxygen. Depending on what you're doing is going to depend on how much oxygen you're using. The more liters per minute that you have coming out of the oxygen tank, the less time it's going to last. So that brings us to the next point with how many liters per minute of oxygen do you deliver through each device? Well, a nasal cannula, you can deliver between uh, less than one liter per minute, 0.25, depending on what your regulator will do, all the way up to six liters per minute. But that doesn't mean it has to stop there. It just means that's our normal range we're going to do for a nasal cannula. A nebulizer, we're going to do between six to eight liters per minute. Uh, and my general rule is to stay at six liters per minute uh, with the nebulizer. Uh, the non rebreather. Uh, the non rebreather, everybody knows that it's 10 to 15 liters per minute. CPAP, I start out at 10 because of the manufacturer's instructions that I've learned with my CPAP, uh, 10 liters per minute on 10 of PEEP. Uh, but that also goes with your protocols and what your service has uh, trained you to do. Um, so I go on a 10 on a 10. Um, so 10 liters per minute of oxygen with 10 of PEEP. And then your bag valve mass can be anywhere between 15 liters per minute and uh, 25 liters per minute, or however much you can deliver to the patient with your abilities of your regulator. So this kind of concludes going through the respiration section. The next section we're going to cover is artificial ventilation.